everyone. Pleased to see you. I'm grateful that you are making the time to join us for this fantastic session. I have a pulse. I have a pulse every day. It's a little higher right now because I'm very excited to have the chance to talk to my three panelists. Um, and, um, and I'm sure that they will enlighten us in many ways. So let me just go to it. We had quick introductions nonetheless. We have first here, we have Martin Hackman, who is CFO at Tommy Hilfiger and PVH, who also own brands like Calvin Klein and Heritage Brands. Martin is obviously in the perfect position to make those big calls on where are we going to make our bets in terms of capital and what is the return that we're looking for to have the innovations that will make us a more sustainable business. Um, we have Miroslav Duma, who, like Martin, also places capital. She makes bets um, on what are going to be the most innovative solutions that will transform the industry. She herself is a recognized industry transformer, a force for good, um, and, um, and has a particular expertise on materials. And then we have uh, David Roberts at the end here. Um, and David has a lot of expertise in new technologies that we'll hear more about. David is a um, distinguished professor at the Singularity University that actually just set up a shop here in Copenhagen. Um, so, a lot of expertise in the panel, um, and um, I'd really like to start with one of the bigger questions, um, and that is to, uh, to Martin. Um, so, the report that has been launched for this summit calls out a number of issues, and I think we're all acutely familiar with the different sustainability challenges that we have. But from the perspective of a CFO, what do you see to be sort of the most significant innovation challenges that you as a CFO need to make sure that you have capital for to invest in? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Um, maybe first to recognize that in, in the fashion industry, we have a lot of sustainability challenges. They're, they're large scale. And I think as a starting point for brands like us, uh, we should have our sustainability commitments and innovation fully embedded in our business strategy. I think that's extremely important because only then you can really drive change. Only then you will have the right focus, you will allocate all the resources needed to make a change, a meaningful change in the way you operate, in the way you collaborate with stakeholders around you. So I think that's an important part to anchor it in the business strategy. So in terms of innovation itself, uh, technological innovation in materials or manufacturing processes are extremely important. Uh, for us, the big challenge remains to select those that are scalable and those that have the right level of return for us. But it's, it's not just about technological innovation. I, I want to emphasize here that innovation in our business models, in, in, in the systems, the underlying systems, that innovation is as important as innovation in technology. So, just to, just to take an example, with, within our Tommy Hilfiger brand, we've, we've taken an active water stewardship role, and the purpose there really is to collaborate with the vendors, with the suppliers, with the buyers, with governments, with communities that all operate within a certain river basin, and through that, really drive change. And similar for our cotton strategy, cotton is a very important fiber for us. And also there we've partnered with BCI and really with the underlying ambition and really the bigger objective to make a systemic change to the way cotton is being farmed in the world. Let me just a quick follow-up question because you point to a number of different areas that you need to focus on. And how do you make decisions about where you place the capital that you have? Because you don't have limitless capital as no one has. Yeah, and that's, that's, uh, that's of course, the, the, the biggest uh, 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 hurdle, in a way, is, is capital. It's restricted. And I think there, the, uh, the collaboration and to, to partner with, uh, with connectors in the industry and to find those solutions that, that are scalable, uh, that we identify those together and there put our money and invest in those. Uh, that, that, that I think is important that we also there get, get help, support, collaboration to make those decisions. Because the individual decisions we take, the individual investments we do can have an impact, can be meaningful. But I think we need to have that common agenda that was referred to earlier today and to have that consolidation uh, to really make meaningful impact. 
Mira, you're an investor. You're also an innovator. Uh, you're also a catalyst. And I know you're particularly interested in materials and what new materials can do for the industry and put it on a more sustainable track. Say a bit more about the materials part and why you think that could be transformative in turning the industry into a more sustainable industry. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, when we started to dive into the world of material science and biotech and smart textiles, we realized that there is a revolution actually happening in that, um, in that world. And what seemed and sounded like um, a science fiction is actually becoming a science fact nowadays. And uh, the process of running the industry on 100% uh, 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 renewable and alternative energy and resources is inevitable and it will happen no matter what. It's just a matter of time. And just to give you a couple of examples of what's happening, you know, for you to understand <clears throat> the scale, it, it all comes from the perspective of uh, problem solving. So uh, one of the companies that we, laboratories that we have found based in San Francisco that we have invested in and um, are working with now, um, um, they are growing leather and fur in a laboratory environment out of stem cells without killing animals, obviously. There's another amazing company too, um, Italian ladies, that after they um, discovered that there's around 700,000 uh, tons of orange peels end up in landfills every year in Italy only, they started to think what can be done with this uh, so-called garbage. So after two years of uh, experimenting and testing, they came up with the technology of producing uh, fabrics made of 100% recycled orange peels. So they contacted the biggest juice producing companies in Italy and they get that, again, so-called garbage for free because otherwise, you know, the, uh, those companies have to rent landfills. So it's a win-win situation, a zero-waste situation, and uh, it's healthy, breathable, uh, sustainable material. Um, there's another great um, technology uh, called uh, Diamond Foundry. It's a laboratory uh, based in San Francisco. They are growing um, diamonds um, in the laboratory, avoiding environmental issues, kid, kids' slavery issues, and so on and so forth. And um, how they do it, they take a tiny layer of um, mined diamond and inside a laboratory environment, under carbon heat, they grow technically identical diamond uh, diamonds um, within within two weeks maybe, and no one can tell the difference between mined diamond and lab-grown diamond. So again, technically, it's, it's identical. There's only one machine in the world that after a couple of hours of investigation can tell you mined diamond and lab-grown diamond. <clears throat> and even the certificate says it's not, it's not synthetic diamonds, it's not fake diamonds, um, it's not artificial diamonds. It's, again, it's man-made slash uh, lab-grown diamonds. And um, there's another great woman. She's an um, Israeli scientist. Um, she came up with the technology of producing 100% compostable plastic uh, uh, bags that um, you can use everywhere, you know, for, for food industry, for, uh, for clothing and fashion industry. Um, and it's um, basically something that disappears um, after, tw um, after 24 weeks um, go, um, after getting to landfills. Um, there's another um, great example. Um, we've all heard um, about uh, the magical um, uh, effects of uh, silver, right? And so uh, when I came across with um, the technology based in Germany, um, they embed silver yarns in, um, in any kind of fiber, uh, which means that uh, you can wear your short or whatever up to 20 times without bringing it to laundry, um, which uh, means that people are saving up time, money, water, and chemicals, right? Because uh, um, I had this conversation with, um, with um, a Stanford alumni, very smart uh, young lady, and she said, you know, I buy um, a silk t-shirt worth $300, I wear it once and I bring it to laundry right after, uh, and eventually I spend more money on laundry than I actually spent on, um, on the garment, and I don't like it. Uh, it's not comfortable. And so we found another great technology <clears throat> that actually um, is an alternative to silver because silver is not 100% sustainable because it comes from mining. Um, so they embed uh, peppermint in um, any kind of fiber, which has a very strong antimicrobial and anti-radiation um, property. So there is a lot of amazing uh, people, engineers, and scientists that are um, working in this, in this field of material science and, and biotech. And um, yeah, it was very 
it was surprising, shocking in the best possible way to discover, uh, to start discovering um, them. I want to hear more about sort of this scalability issue because as long as I've been in this industry, I've heard these wonderful examples about new materials and, and yet we still look at cotton being, what is it, two thirds of all fibers being used. Um, but before we go back to that conversation, I'd, I'd like to hear you, David, because you're into technology as well. You're looking at some of the more scalable technologies that per definition are scalable. So we're talking about artificial intelligence, we're talking about automation, digitization, sort of that whole specter, 3D printing. Um, what will that do for the industry and, and how, how will they be applied if in the five, next five years or 10 years? Yeah, well, I, I like the, the pick at least of technologies that when you went through there only because those three sort of artificial intelligence, you know, 3D printing, uh, they, they have what we call an exponential uh, attribute to them, meaning that they double in their price performance every year. So doubling something has a very small increment in the beginning, but later on, you know, 10 doublings out, you're, you know, 128 times better price performance. 20 doublings out, you're a million times better price performance. And you know, the, the fashion and the fabric industry have never actually had the opportunity to have these kinds of exponential technologies come into the industry, and it'll mean it'll transform everything. It might take a while. 3D printing will probably really explode about 20 years from now, but 10 years from now, we'll see some of those results right away, and it'll change the entire supply chain. Um, the CEO of Singularity University wears 3D printed sneakers. And so there were only materials that were sent to a 3D printer, and then he printed those up. So there was no factory. There were no people. There, was no, there were no ships transferring the material. I mean, it literally uh, changes how we think about how things get created and how they get moved around. Um, with biometric and RFID devices, uh, in fact, there's a wonderful winner of H&M's Global Change Award this year that is looking at making a device that goes into a, a fabric that gives any piece of fabric a unique ID number in the world. And that may seem like a small capability, but something like that essentially digitizes an industry that's completely undigitized today. It means that you'll know where every piece of clothing goes. It means that when you, after the clothing is used, I mean, today, most companies only know when they get sold. And at that point, they lose all information. Uh, and, and so a whole set of new business models will get created. Your closet will know how many times you've worn a piece of clothing. Uh, when you uh, throw that piece of clothing out, it'll be easy to identify it and, and distribute things. So it, when you digitize an industry, you then are able to digitalize the industry, which means these new models, new ways of doing things get created. And then you end up with big data. And when you've got big data, you can then use artificial intelligence to make very useful decisions. And none of that happens today. I mean, we really are working in an industry that is not that different than it was, you know, 50, 100 years ago. But maybe to make that a bit more real, because, you know, connection between artificial intelligence and less water. Where is, where is that connection between the issues that are so elegantly portrayed in the, the Pulse report and the use of artificial intelligence. Could you, yeah. sort of in a practical way, just help us understand that connection? So, you know, uh, I think, uh, so there's a great quote about how software is eating the world. How yeah. basically, like, if you're not in the business of software, you're not going to be in business in the future. But artificial intelligence is eating software. <laughs> Everywhere where there is software, there will be AI. And it changes everything. You know, uh, you gave some great examples of uh, how we are now kind of bioengineering organisms to create things. Well, the truth is that we, we don't really know how to do that well today. We know we can type DNA, we can create a new organism, uh, we know the end result, but we don't really know what to type. And AI is fabulous to solve those kinds of problems. And so you'll see it in every facet of an industry, wherever there is thinking. I mean, ultimately, Everything that we've gotten comes to us because we think. <laughs> and AI is essentially alien intelligence. It's actually completely adding to an intellect 
that we've never really had an upgrade for in, you know, 50,000 years. <laughs> and, and one of the things, and I'll, I'll ask you, Martin, this is a little bit off script, but um, obviously as CFO, you are making those decisions about where to place the capital and, and what to really invest in. And, and I imagine that you are getting from your design departments also lots of requests now looking at how do we have smartware? Right, so we'll start in embedding bio biometric sensors in our clothes and we'll use new fibers because they need to do different things for our health. And I can imagine f from the perspective of circular economy, that's going to be a slightly more difficult. Um, how are you weighing those things out against each other? Yeah, so maybe first to comment on, the, uh, uh, on David. Uh, I think the, uh, the industry, the fashion industry, is indeed an old-fashioned industry. And I think the, the digitalization of the fashion value chain will bring a lot of opportunity. It's, if, if I look at, uh, at our company where we've invested into the creation of what's called a, a digital showroom, um, of course with the intent to be more efficient in the selling process and, and, and all sorts of other business uh, gains, but it also results in over time an 80% reduction of the need for physical samples. So I think that's an example where digitalization actually can have a big sustainability contribution. Uh, similar, if we, if we then look back into the process and we go to design, also there, the design is a traditional process today. Uh, the rise of digital design, uh, 3D digital design, will also bring enormous opportunities. Uh, again, not just for the business, for speed, uh, but also from a sustainability point of view, you at a much earlier stage in your design process can be uh, conscious about what am I designing, how am I designing it, and what does that mean at the end of the life cycle of a product. So I see a lot of opportunities in, in digitalization, also in data. I think that data can also help us to make better decisions in every step of the process. Um, yeah, all the new developments in terms of uh, wearable technology, I don't think it makes it easier. Also there, it's, it's for us a, 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 a difficult decision where to go after. Some things are already happening and it's, it's, it's maybe unavoidable, uh, but, but it doesn't make it easier. Not from a, a commercial point of view, what do you really want to commercialize? What do you really want to bring to the market? What fits within your brand strategy? What fits within your positioning? But also I think in terms of sustainability, it has a lot of impacts that we have to assess and we have to take into consideration. I imagine, Mira, these are the questions that you were faced with when you're looking at where to invest, what are the, what are the innovations that are most likely going to have the potential to be scalable. Um, is it that combination of the technologies that David talked about and the new materials that gives us hope that we can move from the niche to something which is truly mainstream and have, for instance, cotton replaced with different types of fibers? The good news is that, um, led by government contracts and research institutions for military and space industries, um, many groundbreaking discoveries have been made around 10 to 30 years ago already. So it's not new, it's been there, it's just the right time to try to get it out of the laboratories and bring it to the market, you know, because it's, it, the time is ready, the generations okay. are ready, millennials and Gen Z, and uh, so on and so forth. And um, Again, the good news is that, um, you know, there's this, what's happening now in the world, we're actually at the forefront of fourth industrial revolution, and that's what Davos this year was, was all about, right? And uh, again, um, to support what David was saying, um, like, just, you know, to, to give you uh, two very bright examples. Um, when uh, iPhone was presented 10 years ago, and nine years ago, the app, so-called app economy uh, was, was born, um, by in 2015, um, it generated around $100 billion in revenue, uh, which is more than um, a cinema industry that has been in existence for centuries. Um, and imagine, obviously, the third industrial revolution that, you know, uh, with, with, with the help of which all those amazing companies like Google and Apple and, and others were born, uh, killed lots of old jobs, but created lots of new jobs. And again, thinking of just one app economy, right, that uh, changed, um, I think, every, everything in our lives. Um, 
I think that the, that the uh, circular um, um, economy is um, exactly the same thing. There's another uh, bright example of Kodak that in 1998 employed around 170,000 people and um, delivered about 85% uh, of photo paper uh, worldwide. And in just a couple of years, their business model uh, disappeared and they went bankrupt. So that's basically, you know, again, what seemed a science fiction years ago is, uh, is actually becoming a science fact. And uh, we're very positive about it. I know, David, that when we spoke the other day uh, and we talked about technology and I think we can all get a little bit hyped up by new technologies and what they can do for us and how they can transform an industry. Yeah. You also made the point that they're not necessarily going to solve all of the ills of the industry. Say more about that. Why is it that technology is not going to do the trick alone? Yeah, well, so there's a big difference between an invention and an innovation and scaling. <laughs> In fact, I kind of think now, I used to think, well, the, whenever you create something, there's always two creations, right? There's one in your mind, and then there's one in the physical world. But really, the one in the physical world has these three parts to it. And the invention is likened to Thomas Edison. At the time he invented the light bulb, there were 22 or 23 other people that had all invented light bulbs also. But he had taken the invention and turned it into an innovation because he had also created the way to create the electricity with an alternator and a way to power it and transfer the lines and he created the system. And then after Thomas Edison, a whole set of other people were involved in the scaling. And you've got to do all three of these. If, you know, there are enormous hopes because today we have so many inventions happening that give the promise of a new kind of a leather, a new kind of a fabric. But we also have to recognize that there are creations that have to happen to make the system work and creations that have to happen to make it scale. Because if it doesn't scale, it's just always left as a small technological innovation that is never disruptive. And there is a huge difference between innovation and disruption. It's all about execution, you know. There is, um, yeah. there is a very interesting report based on 250 um, success, most successful um, tech companies, and they came up with the top five reasons why they actually made it, all those 250 companies. And number one, most important, was timing, that the technology innovation discovery came exactly on time. The second one, most important, uh, was uh, team and execution, you know. Uh, idea is 1% and team and execution is uh, 99, exactly, you know, talking about the economy of scales and everything. And actually, when, um, when we meet a founder, uh, an engineer, or the CEO of the company, um, that's the conversation that we always have is, uh, yes, the technology is there, it's amazing, but where is the financial model and where is your actually strategy of, of scaling up, you know, and, not, and making sure that the technology is not worth... Uh, like a spaceship, you know, so that's, I think, the most important. And, and to, may, may I comment? To have that that's uh, successful, <laughs> oh, to have that successful uh, execution, we should also uh, look wider. We should also yeah. look outside of our industry. So we there need support, incentives from governments. Uh, we need financial institutions to support these initiatives. Um, we need universities uh, to put emphasis on certain of those developments. So. It's also here we have to think much wider to, to achieve that successful execution. Fantastic. We need to feel the pulse of, pulse of all the others as well. Thank you so much. Join me in uh, thanking the panel and um, okay. we'll move on. Thank you very much.